The Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to where there was a garden into which he and his disciples entered. Judas, his betrayer, also knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas got a band of soldiers and guards from the chief priests and the Pharisees and went there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, knowing everything that was going to happen to him, went out and said to them, Who are you looking for? They answered him, Jesus the Nazarene! He said to them, I am. Judas, his betrayer, was also with them. When he said to them, I am, they turned away and fell to the ground. <coughs> so he again asked them, Whom are you looking for? Jesus the Nazarene. Jesus answered, I told you that I am. So if you're looking for me, let this man go. This was to fulfill what he had said. I have not lost any of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Marcus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its scabbard. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father gave me? So the men of soldiers, the tribune, and the Jewish guards seized Jesus, bound him, and brought him to Annas first. He was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had counseled the Jews that it was better that one man should die rather than the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Now the other disciple was known to the high priest, and he entered the courtyard of the high priest with Jesus. But Peter stood at the gate outside. So the other disciple, the acquaintance of the high priest, went out and spoke to the gatekeeper and brought Peter in. Then the maid, who was the gatekeeper, said to Peter, You are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the guards were standing around a charcoal fire that they had made because it was cold and were warming themselves. Peter was also standing there, keeping warm. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I have spoken publicly to the world. I have always taught in the synagogue or in the temple area where all the Jews gather. And in secret I have said nothing. Why ask me? As those who heard me, what I said to them, they know what I say. When he had said this, one of the temple guards standing there struck Jesus and said, Is this the way you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him down to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing there keeping warm, and they said to him, You are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the one whose ear Peter had cut off, said, Didn't I see you in the garden with him? Again Peter denied it, and immediately the cock crowed. Then they brought Jesus from Caiaphas to the praetorium. It was morning, and they themselves did not enter the praetorium in order not to be defiled so they could eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and said, What charge do you bring against this man? They answered him and said to him, If he were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. At this Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews answered him, We do not have the right to execute anyone in order that the word of Jesus might be fulfilled that he said, indicating the kind of death he would die. So Pilate went back into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this on your own, or others have told you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? 
Your own nation and the chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom does not belong to this world. If my kingdom did belong to this world, my attendants would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not here. So Pilate said to him, Then you are a king? Jesus answered, You say I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? When he had said this, he again went out to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I release one prisoner to you at Passover. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, Not this one, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a revolutionary. When Pilate took Jesus, <clears throat> then Pilate took Jesus and had him scourged. And the soldiers wove a crown out of thorns and placed it on his head and clothed him in a purple cloak. And they came to him and said, Hail, king of the Jews! And they struck him repeatedly. Once more Pilate went out and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you, so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple cloak. And he said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the guards saw him, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this statement, he became even more afraid and went back into the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? Jesus did not answer him. So Pilate said to him, Do you not speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you and I have the power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You will have no power over me if it have not been given to you from above for this reason. The one who handed me over to you has a greater sin. Consequently, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release him, you are not a friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and seated him on the judge's bench in the place called Stone Pavement, in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was the preparation day for Passover, and it was about noon. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Take him away! Take him away! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then he handed them over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, in Hebrew, Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus in the middle. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Now many of the Jews read this inscription, because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four shares, a share for each soldier. They also took his tunic, but the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top down. So they said to one another, Let's not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it will be. In order that the passage of scripture might be fulfilled, it says, They divided my garments among them, and for my vesture they cast lots. This is what the soldiers did. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary of Magdala. 
When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple there whom he loved, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. After this, aware that everything was now finished, in order that the scripture might be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. There was a vessel filled with common wine, so they put a sponge soaked in wine on a sprig of hyssop and put it up to his mouth. When Jesus had taken the wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he handed over the spirit. Let us kneel. Judas was standing with them. A little detail that the apostle John puts in the gospel. That Judas was with them when he said, I am. I mean, Judas was chosen by the Lord as one of the twelve disciples. And obviously at the time that Jesus picked them, did not think that he will be the one who betrayed him. The Gospel of Luke says that Judas Iscariot became a traitor. That means that Judas was not born a traitor. He became one. Out of his own freedom, he chose to betray the Lord. Why did he do that? Why would Judas betray the Lord? Some may say that he had political reasons. Jesus was not the political figure or the revolutionary that he was expecting. Perhaps.
perhaps the people of God were expecting a Messiah that was more in tune or against Roman occupation. Others may, others may think that Judas uh, had envy. But actually the Gospels tell us why he betrayed Jesus. In a very simple way. The Gospels say that the motive was very simple. Money. Judas was entrusted with the treasury. And at the coming of that moment, he betrayed the Lord because he wanted money. Remember the anointing in Bethany when Judas protested that they were using the expensive oil on the Lord. And it was Judas who said, why waste that anointment, that ointment, or that perfume when they could have given the money to the poor. Not that he cared anything about the poor, but he, he was a thief. So the betrayal of Jesus was actually a very simple one. He was stealing money, and apparently he didn't have enough. One can say that he was tempted by Satan, but in order for one to do the work of Satan, one would have to have another motive. Why would not do something for the devil, just for the devil's sake? One does it because one thing think he's going to get something out of that. So the motive is money. He's the anti-God, in a way. No one can serve two masters. You cannot serve God and man and mammon. It becomes very simple for us. Money, says the scripture, the first letter to Timothy, is the root, the root of all evil. And it's something uh, very simple for us also to betray the Lord for something as simple as that. What is it that causes a lot of grief in our society today if it's not also the thirst or the hunger for money? hoarding, or a hunger for gold. There is this commercial, everybody apparently wants you to buy gold. There is an ad on television of this man who says, he touches the coins of gold and he says, I love the feel of gold. Every time I hear that, it kind of cringes my soul. We tend to follow the same thing and we tend to love money. It becomes like an idol an object in and of itself. Supposed to see it in the right perspective with money lies, we tend to see it as an end in itself, something we have to possess. It's interesting because the Gospel says to us many times that if we follow the Lord, all things are possible for those who believe. But the role that we live in says the contrary, that all things are possible to him who has money. On a certain level, we think that it is true. That if you only had money, all your problems will be solved. It is not true. It's a fallacy. It's an idol. I'm not saying that money is bad. We are not taking a collection after this. <laughs> you know? A British friend of mine, well, I was a kid. He later became a friend of mine. I'm going to have to translate this into English. He said, money was like manure. Is that how you pronounce it? Yes. I don't know how to pronounce that without saying a bad word. <laughs> money is like manure. It only helps to fertilize the fields of the Lord. You got the hint. It's a medium for something else. It cannot be an idol in itself. It has to serve for something. But I think it's very important for us to meditate upon that today because that is the reason why Judas betrayed the Lord. And I think that's the reason why many people betray the Lord. I think it's something important for us also in the church, as a parish, that sometimes we think that if we only had more money, our parish would be better. If we had more money, 
there we can do more things. But that's a fallacy. It's a trap. It's a trap. It's an illusion. It's not real. And we forget to worship God, to make Him the protagonist of the story of this week. Because we only think in our fantasy world that we, if we only had money, all our problems would be solved. I think that's the reason why Pope Francis is calling us constantly not to make money an idol. Yes, we always have to see it in that context and spiritually challenge ourselves so that we only see it as how it is that it serves its purpose. So that we don't get attached or overly attached to things that are not meant to attach us and give ourselves completely to the service of God. So we entrust our care to the Lord and we ask Him that to take away from us any false idolatry that might be in our soul. Any remnants that keeps us bound to love money more than God or things. Though He promises security, He takes it away. He promises freedom, but it enslaves us and can destroy families. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.